Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that mercy triumphs over judgment. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak your loving mercy to us as we open your word today. For Jesus' sake and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, I just want to start with a a silly sort of story, the, the kind of story you only tell in church. Um, but uh, there's a story of, of an old lady uh, who unfortunately gets uh, caught shoplifting. And she comes before the judge and he says to her, do you know why you're here? And she said, shoplifting. He says, why did you do it? She says, I don't know. He says, what did you take? She said, a, t- a can of peaches, a can of peaches. He's trying to figure out how to punish her. And he asks her, how many peaches were in the can? She says, there were six peaches. He said, well, I'm going to give you one day in prison for every peach she stole. So that's six days in prison. Uh, she said, would anyone else like to, to say anything? Her husband jumps up and says, she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> yeah. um, so... Uh, Folks, I want to think, I just want to think about judgment a little bit today. Um, Judgment, and I suppose uh, to think about as we want to have deep souls um, that are not shallow souls, but are are deep ones, the enemy would want to keep us in a place of judgment and judging one another. uh, And the Lord would want us to be people, I think, of mercy. Uh, it's interesting, if you actually look through the Bible uh, and look through your, your NIV or your ESV or your King James or whatever, and you look and you see the word judgment, especially in the New Testament, you're going to see a bit of an issue, really, because uh, you'll read a number of verses, maybe something like 17 or 18 verses, which seem to tell us that we must not judge, Okay. Okay, and that sounds good, doesn't that, to sort of postmodern ears? Well, I can't judge. You know, live and let live. Let everybody do things their own way. As long as they're not doing anybody any harm, let them tear on, okay? Do not judge. Uh, but you will find about seven or eight less, but still significant numbers that tell us that we are to judge, okay? So this seems like a contradiction in Scripture. It seems like uh, we're being told two different things but I'm not quite sure that's true. Like, I'm sure we have all heard in a conversation where we hear sin being isolated, highlighted, and pointed out, we we think of that phrase, don't we? Judge not, lest you be judged, okay? Which is from uh, Matthew uh, 7, I think. Uh, But then we hear in, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15, that the spiritual person judges all things, okay? The spiritual person judges all things. So we have this sort of uh, thing in Scripture where it seems like most of the time, much of the time we're being told not to judge, but uh, a fair amount of the time we're being told that we should judge. Now, I think this is only part of the answer. We probably don't have enough time this morning to think about all of the answer and all of the reasons for this, but I think it does uh, revolve to some extent around two Greek words, Okay. One is krino, okay, everybody say krino, one, two, three, krino, okay, and that's where we get the word critic, okay, krino is where we get the word critic, and that means judgment as to condemn another, Uh, that means judgment to rule or damn, to use the law and to decree, okay, that's what crino means. Okay, let me just say that again. Crino means judgment as to condemn, to rule, and to damn. Crino. So when Jesus says, crino, lest you be crinoed. Okay? He doesn't actually say that, but that's just me sticking a word in, okay? Crino, lest you be crinoed. Judge. Uh, do, sorry, do not crino, lest you be crinoed. Do not judge, lest you be judged. Crino. The other word is anacrino. Okay, let's say that one, two, three. Anacrino. And that's the sister of crino, Anna. 
Okay, anacranium. No, that means to examine, weigh up, or discern. To examine, weigh up, or discern. So 1 Corinthians 2.15, the spiritual person anacrinos all things, weighs up, examines, or discerns all things. And I, folks, I think this is pretty helpful, really, in a sense, when we think about the difference between these two things. Because we, we cannot be in this middle place where we don't judge anyone else or anybody's sin, but we don't judge sin at all. We can't sort of not be crino and not be anacrino. We're not meant to be crino. We're not meant to be people who damn others. But we are meant to be people who uh, discern sin and deal with sin, realizing the dangers of sin and the damage of sin. We're not damning others. We're not making persons uh, hurt. But we are serious about purging uh, our lives and also society of sin. We are not meant to do what only God can do, which is judge sin righteously. And of course, we know that when Jesus came, he did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. But by the same token, we do know that Jesus was serious about sin. And when he comes again, he intends to deal with the problem of sin completely begun at the cross and completed when he comes again. The church needs to be a place where we isolate, identify, and examine sin so that we make sure that we're dealing with it, but that we're never judging people and individuals in a way that damages them. I know these are our difficult dichotomies, but they're really, really, I think, important. We want to be anacrino people and not crino people. We want to judge the concept of sin, but not judge people for their sin. The church should be a place of love and not judgment. Do you agree? In a challenge to every church, I think, on planet Earth, James addresses one of the elephants in the room of church life. James was called James the Just. So he was a man who, who really did judge sin. He called sin out. James was, of course, the half-brother of Jesus. And we believe the book of James to be the very first book written in the New Testament. Do you know that? It's the, it's the oldest of all the books, probably written in AD 50. And, judge, and James the just deals with an issue of judgment that exists within the local church in the very earliest days of Christianity. And he hits the elephant in the room. There's a grading of people, a judging of people happening in the early church. Now, it's not to do with some, perhaps, of the issues of our day, okay? It's to do particularly here with uh, who has and who doesn't have. Because church at this stage, existing in the Roman Empire, it was a place where, you know, society was carved up into slaves and free, rich and poor, all those sorts of ways. And here's what James says to the church as he addresses one of the biggest elephants in the room. My brothers and sisters... Okay, as he's addressing this, he's pointing out, this is a family problem, okay? A problem within the family of God. My brothers and sisters, show no partiality. Show no favoritism. Don't show judgment. As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. My brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. What's he essentially saying? He's saying that you cannot hold the faith of Jesus Christ and hold partiality and discrimination. You can't hold those two things together. It probably, in practice, what we see across the church is that People do try and hold these things together, don't they? They try and hold 
Jesus and faith, but they also hold lots of isms, don't they? Like racism and ageism and sectarianism and lots of isms. They hold those positions of judgment while trying to hold also on to the Lord of glory and faith in him. You know, Jesus is the one we read about in Ephesians 2 who broke down the walls of hostility, broke down the things that divided people. And now in Christ, there's no longer slave nor free, no male or female. We read these categories have been removed by the death of Jesus. But here we see them trying to hold on to Jesus, but also hold on to partiality. It should not be so within the church, but yet it is. How can you show partiality between rich people and poor people in a church if you worship and say you hold to the faith of Jesus who hung out with prostitutes and sinners, who touched the poor and the unclean and then died to prove the unsurpassable worth of every single one of them? How can you say you worship this Lord of glory, if we continue to hold on to judgment over one another. You can't hold the hand of the one who held the hand of the poor and not love the poor. You can't hold the one who said he died to prove the unsurpassable worth of every person and hold on to racism or sectarianism or any otherism because he was a great opponent of all the isms. That's who he is. Look at verse 4. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The example that James uses is, he says that two people walk into church, okay? One person uh, is poor. The other person has loads and loads and loads of gold rings on. These were proof of wealth and prosperity. And they say, look at the seat you give the boy with the rings and look at the seat you give the poor one. How can you say you worship Jesus who loved the poor when you treat that person like they should sit on the floor? Now, folks, what ism would, would James bring against us that James the just bring against us? He says this, you have become judges with evil thoughts. I think we can all see in ourselves that we judge some people. And unconscious bias, perhaps, was the issue in James chapter 2. They really didn't realize that they were treating the poor differently than the rich, but they were. What about you and what about I? You see, here is the key perspective that we need to see in verse 5. It says, listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? Here's what James is saying. He's saying, see the way that you're treating that rich person and that poor person as they come in or as we meet them out on the street or whatever. He's saying, realize it from heaven's perspective. Has God not chosen poor people like that to be inheritors of the kingdom of God? Does God not care as much about that poor man as he does the rich man? Did Jesus not die as much for the poor man as he did for the rich man? Your isms have drawn lines that Jesus died to destroy. You know, there was a beautiful picture of the kingdom yesterday. Liverpool fielded 11 different nationalities. Oh, what a holy team. Okay, what a holy team. It should be a diverse community, the church. It should be the most diverse community at all. There should be all sorts of people in the church. But folks, the reality is, that we are brilliant at drawing lines. Tim Keller, who's now in heaven, is one of my favorite writers. If you want to read some great books, just start buying Tim Keller books, an amazing American preacher. 
And he says this. He says, you know, Jesus died to remove the lines of society. But why is it that when you look at who marries who within the church, we marry within socioeconomic bounds. Rich people marry rich people, okay? We marry within educational bounds. Smart people, highly educated people marry highly educated people. Why is it so? He says, even if you want to be even shallower than that, good-looking people, objectively good-looking people, or subjectively good-looking people, marry good-looking people. Why has what Jesus done on the cross not changed things in such a way that we show no partiality with one another? That we really are brothers and sisters within the church and that mercy has triumphed over judgment. I love a story, I'm sure I've shared it with you before, about Mother Teresa. And we know Mother Teresa went round those slums of Calcutta ministering to people and blessing them. And apparently there was a cynical London reporter who wanted to figure out why, okay, why is she doing this? What is actually going on here? And apparently he followed Mother Teresa for a, a number of days and he saw her ministering to people who were just about to die. And he thought, what is the point of this? Like, I mean, she's never going to grow anything with this ministry that she's involved in because she's ministering to these sort of almost, he almost said, losers who are never going to give her anything back. And apparently the reporter was, was essentially writing this awful article when they encountered a particular man who had no arms and no legs. Uh, and apparently he was literally being eaten uh, and... Uh, with, with, with all sorts of awful parasites and only had a few hours left to live. And apparently, Mother Teresa attended to him for hours and hours throughout the night with, with, a, with a wet towel, just uh, rubbing his face, giving him dignity. And apparently, it was only then that the reporter was broken. Apparently, the, the piece of paper he was writing on just started to be showered with teardrops. Because here's what the man said before he passed away. He said, all my life I've lived like a dog, but tonight I die like a king. All my life I've lived like a dog, and tonight I die like a king. Mercy triumphed over judgment. Mercy triumphed over judgment. This week, uh, our life group won a prize because I think we're the first to finish in Merce. Okay, <laughs> we may not be the first to finish Merce, but we did finish a Merce, uh, which is the first five books of the Bible we've read in community. And uh, one of the things that we noted from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were that this new society that Israel moved into, the land of Canaan, they were meant to set up these things called cities of refuge. Cities of refuge. And these were places where people who were in danger or being pursued for uh, an accused crime could go and, and find refuge and cling onto the horns of the altar and be protected. And apparently the bigger that the nation became, the bigger that Canaan's uh, might spread, the more cities of refuge they were meant to actually install within the nation. Places of mercy for people who needed mercy. The children of Israel were meant to be known for their mercy. Known as a safe place of refuge. Are we known as a safe place of refuge to the world? Are we known for crino, which is condemn? Or are we known for mercy, anacrino, where we do weigh up sin and we do examine sin, but we don't judge or hurt anybody because of sin. How do we do what we talked about last week? Change the soundtrack in the minds so the horses are confused. How do we change the soundtrack of our church? Just two very simple ideas about how we, we might do that. 
first way that I have found to deal with the issue of judging others is to look within. All right, one, two, three. Look within. All right. Now, here's what C.S. Lewis says. The true Christian's nostril is continually attentive to their inner cesspool. The true Christian's nostril is continually attentive to their inner cesspool. If we wash every day in the shower of God's grace, we will realize that the water underneath our feet is pretty dirty every morning. Have you noticed that? We need our feet washed every single day. And when we look within ourselves, we will see that. I like what a writer called John Tyson writes. And I don't want you to fixate too much on these categories, but I want you to get the point. When I see clearly, this is John Tyson, an Australian guy who leads a church called Church of the City, New York. He says this, when I see clearly my own sexual brokenness, I am much less likely to judge the LGBT community. And I cry to Jesus for the transformation of my own heart. When I clearly see my lack of compassion for the poor, I am much less likely to judge other people in society as lazy and irresponsible, and I cry out to God for a more generous heart. When I see my own frustration and unmet longings, I am much less likely to judge young people as idealistic dreamers, and I ask God to revive my own sense of call. When I see my own sin, I am less likely to go to culture war, and I seek my own inner transformation and renewal. If I want to see clearly, the log must come out of my eye first. Would you not agree? We need to be people who look within, realizing that we're not perfect, so that it causes us to show mercy to those in society who aren't perfect either. We look within. Here's the second idea. Look within. Here's the second. Look at him. One, two, three. This is what preachers do when they haven't made a PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> Philip Yancey. Who's read What's So Amazing About Grace? Who's read that book? What a book. Hey, if you haven't read that one, it's a hit. Okay, so get that onto your, your Goodreads account. Um, here's what Philip Yancey says. When I am tempted to recoil in horror from sinners, from different people, I remember what it must have been like for Jesus on earth. He was perfect, sinless, and he had every right to be repulsed by the behavior of those around him. Yet he treated notorious sinners with mercy and not judgment. One who had been touched by grace will no longer look on those who stray as those evil people or those poor people who need our help. Nor must we search for signs of love worthiness because grace teaches us that God loves because of who God is, not because of who we are. Look at him. Folks, one final thing to say. In John 8, and we know this story so well, there is a woman thrown down, probably half-dressed in front of Jesus, and the religious people say, this woman was caught in the act of sin. A particular type of sin. What should we do? We should, should we do what the law of Moses says and stone her? Or should we let her go? Jesus, which should we do? Should we be lawful and loveless? Or should we be merciful and lawless? What should we do? It's the ultimate trap. What a trap. Jesus thinks, oh, you know, I, I, I'm either going to be loving and liberal, but lawless, or I'm going to be lawful and loveless and judgmental. How on earth do I deal with this situation? How can I be 
anachrino and serious about sin, but not crino and just go around judging the world like an angry school teacher. Sorry if there's school teachers. There are school teachers. <laughs> You're not angry ones, though. Um, how, how, how do I do this? And the wonderful thing is, the most humbling thing is for us to hear is, Jesus got down and rode in the dirt. Okay? And you know this. I've told you this before. Commentators try and figure out, what did he write in the dirt? John 3.16. That's what some churches will tell you. John 3.16. I can pretty much tell you that's not what he writes in the dirt. Okay? <laughs> or some people say, does he write the entire law, the Ten Commandments? Or does he write, does he draw a cross? Which do you think? Which do you go for? You know what I think he does? I think he wants time to pray. And I think when he's down there, he says, God, Father, give me a word of wisdom for this moment. And as he scribbles in the dust, I think he receives a message from heaven which says, tell them whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. Tell them to look within and when they look within, decide whether or not they're perfect. And from that position, let them decide what judgment they will uh, throw out. You see, the reason why we judge not Anacrino is because we don't want to be judged. We're serious about weighing up sin. We're serious about dealing with sin. We're serious about being a prophetic voice against sin within our society, but not in a way that harms or hurts others. And Jesus holds these th two things together. Law and mercy. And he holds them together in no more powerful way than that. When he, he takes the broken law upon himself but holds humanity with his other hand. And he draws us together and removes the isms by the breaking of his own body. And then, when thud, 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 thud happens, and they don't judge her, do you know what he says to the woman? Go now and leave your life of sin. He doesn't judge her, but he's serious about sin. What a church we would be if we could be merciful, but committed to God's truth in a way that blesses the world. Let's stand together.